Medicine's greatest secret is our inner healing potential, and it's most powerful under anesthesia when we let go of the reality we think we know. This is the power of the mind and body that often makes us doctors feel very uncomfortable because we can't measure it the same way we can measure blood tests like your thyroid hormone or your hemoglobin level. Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And a couple weeks ago, I had a patient whom I called the night before surgery only to find them completely and utterly sloshed in the middle of a drinking binge. There is no judgment here about their choice, but I will say that it certainly was not helpful or conducive to a safe surgery preparation. As you know, I call my patients the night before surgery to help them prepare for the totally understandably scary, anxiety-provoking fears before going under anesthesia, giving up control of your body, and being cut open by your surgeon. Fortunately, it was only a minor surgery, and it wasn't indicated to cancel the surgery outright, even though it was far from ideal. So what happened to this patient during their surgery? When should they have hit the pause button on drinking? What are the risks of drinking alcohol before surgery? And most importantly, what are the ways that patients can actually transform their lives under the experience of anesthesia, similar to psychedelics, to address even the most hardcore addictions like alcoholism, like in this patient? The first thing was that the patient was super apologetic and remorseful in the morning. And they told me that they had actually been struggling with alcoholism for months and years and were trying to get off of their alcohol addiction. This becomes super important for how I help them fall asleep. We'll get to that in a minute. First, let's start with the interactions of alcohol under anesthesia. Number one is the risk of withdrawals, which is what happens in the 24 to 48 hour period after you abruptly stop drinking alcohol. This is important after your operation because you can bet they're not gonna serve you beer or wine after your operation in your hospital bed. Alcohol withdrawal is one of the few life-threatening withdrawals that can lead to life-threatening seizures or more mildly, nausea, vomiting, fevers, chills, and other really unpleasant symptoms, although the unpleasant ones aren't necessarily gonna kill you like the seizures. We will treat those seizures if they happen with medications like benzodiazepines or propofol, but this can mimic other life-threatening conditions like malignant hyperthermia and can still be incredibly unpleasant even if it doesn't kill you outright. Number two is going to be the increased anesthesia dose requirements in patients that are chronic alcoholics. Acute alcohol intoxication actually lowers your anesthesia requirements because you're kind of already halfway there. And it's not a surprise that historically, alcohol was used as a very primitive type of anesthetic. No, it didn't work very well because of all these complications that we're talking about. But long-term alcohol use increases your anesthesia dose requirements and the more anesthesia that you get, the more risk of side effects. And this did affect my patient, which we'll talk about in a minute. Some of the most unpleasant side effects are gonna be higher risk of nausea and vomiting after surgery, and even worse pain potentially. Number three is that alcohol impairs the immune system. Your immune system is critical during and after surgery because wound healing is all mediated by your immune system. The slower your wound healing, the greater your pain throughout the recovery because it's taking longer to heal the painful wounds. And the more impaired your wound healing, the greater the chance of a bad cosmetic experience. So in particular for my patients that are having plastic surgery or aesthetic surgery, we do not want them drinking alcohol because, well, you don't want to have unsightly scars at the end of this, right? Number four is that alcohol can, quote, thin the blood. More bleeding during surgery increases the risk of things like needing blood transfusions or, of course, death. So in particular, before major surgeries, we do not want patients drinking alcohol because that might exacerbate an already high blood loss surgery. And all blood transfusions have significant risks associated with them, so we want to avoid them whenever safely possible. And lastly, number five is going to be the serious risk of heart problems from alcohol. Even in patients who don't have dilated cardiomyopathy from chronic alcohol use, there is still always a risk of cardiac dysfunction from acute alcohol intoxication. We do not want that 
showing itself for the first time under anesthesia in the operating room. All of these effects take about four weeks to normalize. So you wanna stop drinking alcohol for about four weeks before surgery. That amount of time might be even longer though if you already have these side effects from chronic alcohol use. And when can you safely start drinking alcohol again after surgery? In some patients, and maybe most patients, the answer might be never. The more we learn about the dangerous side effects of alcohol use, including increased cancer risk, risk for mental health conditions like depression and cardiovascular risk, the more apparent it is that some patients, maybe most, should never be drinking alcohol. But with regards to healing after surgery, it's prudent to wait for all of your surgical wounds to fully heal before drinking alcohol again. And that depends on the type of surgery that you had. It might be as little as two or three weeks for a minor surgery. It might be as long as a couple of months after a major surgery, like a major abdominal or thoracic surgery. So what happened with my patient who was completely drunk when I called them the night before surgery? Well, first thing the following morning, they apologized profusely. They no longer had any signs or symptoms of being intoxicated because that would result in us canceling an elective surgery. So we did proceed. They needed about 50% more anesthesia than would have been expected for their body weight and the rest of their medical history. And yeah, I have plenty of videos on the different things that adjust your anesthesia requirements. Things like red hair, marijuana use, and other substances and medications. This patient's surgery went okay, with the exception of a little bit more bleeding and hematoma or swelling around the surgery site, possibly because of the blood thinning interactions of alcohol with your own bleeding coagulation system. And they woke up very nauseous and dry heaving multiple times in the recovery area. But fortunately, there were no major surgical complications or major anesthesia complications, largely because this was still a very minor surgery. So the most important part of all of this is how the patient fell asleep for the anesthesia. They fell asleep with clinical hypnosis and of course anesthesia medications as I provided positive affirmations about their self-efficacy to be able to overcome their struggle with alcohol addiction. There's also opportunities throughout the surgery while they're under anesthesia to also provide positive affirmations to this end goal. Even if they appear to be unconscious under general anesthesia, the human brain is still absorbing things in ways that we really don't fully understand. We call this the Dr. Strange phenomena in anesthesia. Miraculously, the patient woke up and within a couple of minutes in the recovery area, they already began telling me that they didn't want to touch alcohol again. Well, they had said that to others before as well, but they gave me some pretty strong vindiction behind that in their recovery area, despite coming out of anesthesia just a couple minutes prior. They told me that their relationship with alcohol was different. The alcohol was just a crutch in them seeking some greater fulfillment and purpose to their life. Yes, this individual had suffered several serious traumas in the past, and yes, they were using alcohol to try to put those traumas at bay, a form of coping mechanism that isn't helpful to address the underlying root cause. Something seemed to have switched in their brain, in their mind, in their understanding of the root cause of those past traumas through this anesthesia experience, which can be very similar to psychedelic experiences when done under medical supervision with a compassionate, caring, and loving guide, which is what I help my patients with in my ketamine infusion clinic. I know that as of three months later, the patient has still not had any alcohol. Will this be a lifelong effect? I don't know yet, but certainly the patient as of last contact was incredibly empowered to continue their streak and had no cravings or inclinations to ever touch alcohol again. This is the power of the mind and body that often makes us doctors feel very uncomfortable because we can't measure it the same way we can measure blood tests like your thyroid hormone or your hemoglobin level. And this represents medicine's greatest power, which is your inner healing potential to heal things that us doctors may never be able to heal for you. Whether they're psychological or physical conditions, you often have greater power to heal yourself than you've ever been told.